Welcome to this place on the new year of the church calendar. Um, the church always likes to start a little bit ahead of time. And today is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is a season of waiting, of watching. It's also a season of anticipation but a season as well as of remembering God's promise to dwell in our hearts and to come back into our lives, not only in surprising ways, but in life-giving and healing ways. I hope that everyone received a key this morning and if you did not receive a key, I have extras for those of you online. I have keys that um, if you would like to have one, I will get one to you. Today, we begin in our Advent uh, season 
discovering the key that unlocks the door to our hearts. And so every Sunday in Advent, we're going to go a little bit deeper until on that beautiful Christmas Eve, we see the babe, the one who arrived in a world of poverty and need to bring hope and light and love. So a couple of announcements. Our angel tree is up, and so if you so desire to um, be an angel for a child this Christmas, I invite you to uh, take an angel off of the tree. For those online, give a holler to um, Penny or Sylvia or the office uh, for an angel tree for yourself. I mean. For you to be an angel for a child, I'll get it right. Um, and so that is going on, and we also hope that you've got our Advent packets, and you'll see there's a pajama, drive, pajama and book drive going on as well. And so we invite you to participate in that. There are, are there any other announcements this morning? Donna. Good morning. The pandemic taught us that we need each other more than ever. As we enter the pandemic, are we good? The pandemic taught us that we need each other more than ever. As we enter the Advent season, how can our church become a house where the holy will be born anew, offering respite, sustenance, and care, opening the doors ever wider to those seeking shelter from the onslaught of life? No one church can do it all, but each can do something. As we study the biblical prophets that call us to care for our neighbors and make room in the inn for lonely and frightened spaces within us, are filled with the light of hope, peace, joy, and love. Please join me in reciting the lovely poem in the bulletin. Hope waits for us at Advent. Hope waits for us to trust. Hope waits for our commitment to a land that's kind and just. In this time of preparation for the work of co-creation, for the birthing of the world that heals the ones in pain. Hope is born in us again. So you're getting that message that today's uh, worship service is based on hope. The light of hope. Today we offer the light of hope to illumine the door of welcome. May this light shine in our hearts, in our lives, and in our church. May hope awaken us to possibilities and lead us to greater hospitality. This is room, in, there is room in this inn, a house for the whole. Please join me in reciting the lovely poem. Hope waits for us to act. Hope waits for us to trust. Hope waits for our commitment to a land that's kind and just. In this time of preparation, for the work of co-creation, for the birthing of a world that heals the ones in pain, hope is born in us again.
now a time of passing the peace. I invite you to wave at each other, to give a hug to each other, but let us pass the hope that Christ brings us, the hope of First reading this morning is from Jeremiah chapter 33 verses 14 through 16. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill my gracious promise with the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time I will raise up a righteous branch from David's line who will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is what he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Our second reading is from Psalm 25, verses 4 through 5. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach it to me, because you are the God who saves me. I put my hope in you all day long.
Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, choir. <laughs> So these words from Jeremiah and the psalm, these are the key to Advent. The key, I found this on Amazon, by the way. <laughs> Isn't it great? It's made out of iron, so it likes really hefty. But these words, are words of hope. So the Jeremiah reading this morning comes from uh, the Book of Comfort. It's a part of Jeremiah where he's, he's speaking of God's promise in the world. You see, that's what prophets do. Prophets come into the world and they, they don't pay attention to the ways of the world. They only speak about God's ways in the world. That's why often prophets are killed, because people don't want to hear about God's ways. Sometimes it's a mistaken assumption that God's ways are death and destruction because you hear the word wrath all the time, uh, but this is not God's way. God's way is not to bring death to us. God's way is to bring life and flourishing and healing and wholeness. This is the key to the kingdom, this flourishing, healing, wholeness that God brings. It is us, as we stumble and fall, as we make mistakes, as we hurt each other and hurt ourselves, it is us who bring on the wrath, the death, the sin, the hurt, the despair. We do it to each other all the time, even in the littlest of ways. When we're sitting at the kitchen table at dinner and a text comes in and we think, well, I'll just answer it and then get back to the family. Someone at that table deflates. I guess that text is more important than me. Little ways, and then big ways, like in Jeremiah, where an entire community is just despairing because they have been taken from their grounds, they've been brought into exile, their women have been raped, their children have been killed, their houses have been made into rubble. They have nothing to eat, nothing to drink. They're thirsty, they're cold. War is cruel. It's not, war is not something that God does. It's something that we do. But Jeremiah, Jeremiah comes and he says, no, there is hope. Our God is a faithful God. Our God is a trustworthy God. Our God is full of loving kindness. And of course, we know the greatest gift of all was that Christ child who came to show us how to live in God's kingdom, how to be the ones to bring reconciliation, healing, forgiveness, health, life, to all of creation. In Advent, we are letting go of the old story, the story of death, the story of poverty, the story of war, the story of hurt, the story of betrayal. And we're yearning, seeking, looking for the signs of the new story, the story of love, the story of faith, 
the story of light and caring, forgiveness, hope, peace, joy, love. This morning I gave each of you a key and also there is an insert in the bulletin. And the insert has the verses 1 through 10 of Psalm 25. This psalm is a prayer. This prayer is scripture. It is the key to open the door to our hearts. This, psalm, this prayer has many parts to it. There is a confession, there is intercession, but there's also this firm knowledge that we are not alone, that our God can be trusted. We have a trusty God who even when we might not feel God's presence with us, God is holding us in God's hands. And so I invite you this Advent. If you can, read this psalm twice a day when you wake up in the morning and when you go to sleep at night. Hold on to the key for the words of this prayer is the key that opens our hearts, that allows God to work in us and then enables us to see the signs of God's kingdom blossoming and flourishing and rising up from the ground in this sometimes despairing, often lonely, and at this time of year, dark, most of the time, but it is the light. Praying Psalm 25 every day will change you. I guarantee it. And now, let us pray for the people in our lives, the creatures and the earth in our lives. Do, do, has any of you have a prayer that you would like to lift up this morning? I do. Okay. <laughs> I'm praying that my sister-in-law, who is finally getting back to Puerto Rico this coming Thursday, uh, is going to be safe and sound there. Hopefully not too lonely. Yeah, she's been hanging out with a big crowd in New Jersey, but uh, my prayer is that she's happy there, and my prayer is that we can join her next Thanksgiving, my whole family, in Puerto Rico. It's the plan. Amen, amen. I'd like to continue to pray for our children, who many of them are downstairs getting ready for the Christmas Eve service, it'll be a delightful service, um, the family service at four o'clock. Um, lots of excitement starting to bubble up in this uh, time and place. Any other prayers? I do have the prayer paper uh, from the Narthex uh, with me this morning. Let us join together in our prayer of the people as it appears in your bulletin. Make of my heart a stable, a house for the holy, a warm and sturdy place for hope to live and grow. In this moment, we open the doors of our hearts in honesty before God about what we've done and left undone that created less hope in a hurting world. Mm -hmm. 
Make of my life a stable, a house for the holy, a warm and sturdy place for hope to live and grow. In this moment, we open the doors of our lives to the call of the Spirit, inviting us to become more than we can ask or imagine. Make of our church a stable, a house for the holy, a warm and sturdy place for hope to live and grow. In this moment, we open the doors of this church, filling it with the compassion of Christ for all those who are struggling. We remember and pray for those traveling today, Matthew, Uncle Larry, Gary, Bonnie Sue, Laura, Charles, Betty, Keith, Ruth, Heather and family, Keith, Lois, Gordon. Those who are suffering economic hardship and insecurity in basic needs. May abundance be shared. Those who are suffering mentally, finding it difficult to cope, may paths open and hope return. Those who are suffering illness or injury, may healing abound. Those who are suffering loneliness and isolation, may companionship and solace abound. Those who are suffering discrimination, fear, and violence, may they know respect, respite, and safety. May the advent of compassion be born in us, reside within us, move outward from us, to meet the needs of the world, making a house for the holy that is each and every child of God. And now, as the beloved children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. The story of innkeeping. The Bible doesn't actually mention an innkeeper in the story of Jesus' birth, but this popular notion is alive in our imaginations. Sometimes the innkeeper gets a bad rap, as if providing substandard accommodations for a family about to go through the birthing process. But what if we saw the innkeeper as someone who, with a full house, thought literally outside the box to solve the problem? What if we endeavored to do the same to provide ministry, to house the holy in ways we have not yet imagined? This Advent season, we will offer some stories to stir our imagination and stroke the possibilities for our own hospitality. And I'm going to tell my personal story, uh, one that I've developed over the last 15 years being a member of Tampa Valley Ecumenical Church. On this first Sunday of Advent, I'm speaking today on how, within the inn we call Tampa Valley Ecumenical Church, we are making room for hope to thrive here. In 2016 and 2017, our church council was concerned about finances, as we always are, and the decision was made that we would make do with a part-time pastor. Nina Beth Metcalf was working for a neighboring church part-time. We hired her on a part-time basis, sharing her with her other church. We watched her grow in ministry, fell in love with her upbeat personality, and cherished her absolute devotion to the Word of God, the examples of our Savior Jesus Christ, 
and how she encouraged us to recognize how the lonely and frightened spaces within us can be filled with the light of hope, peace, joy, and love. In May of 2017, Nina Beth was ordained as a full elder in the United Methodist Church. This meant that she would be able, she would be available for a full-time position as dictated by the Greater Church. We first started to panic that another church would snatch her away. Then we started the hard work of hope. We began the FTP Fund, that stood for Full-Time Pastor Fund, in December of 2017. We started our crusade with many fundraisers and a lot of prayer. Spaghetti dinners, dinner theater, rummage sales, flea markets, Christmas in July, renting our classrooms and fellowship hall to outside groups during the week. We then started looking at our savings accounts and invested the money wisely. Our hope continued, and six months later, on July 1st, 2018, we hired our 9MF full time. At PVEC, we have an extraordinary record of Christian outreach, outreach to our community. We don't, we, why don't we just form another way to serve? Hot meals. The, the monthly chicken dinner was born. I also thought that perhaps we could make people see what a wonderful place PVEC was, draw them in to attend worship, join the church, and build our financial safety net. Remember, I'm the stewardship chair. So the first Thursday of each month, our congregation would donate the food to the dinner, and people would come. Some were congregation members, but most were just people from the community looking for a good meal that was inexpensive. We prepared 100 meals at $5 each. Most of the time, we sold them. Then the pandemic happened. As with the rest of the world, economic times were hard, and all of our fundraisers were canceled. But hope still drove us to imagine how we could make room at our inn, now outside, in fresh air. We decided that takeout dinners were a possibility. So we began taking orders for meals in advance, preparing the food, packaging them and bringing them upstairs to the traffic circle at the front of the church on the first Thursday of each month. I would deliver pre-ordered meals to people's cars and chat with them. Then an incredible thing started happening. I started to realize the chicken dinner was not about money, but about people who needed to share their problems as they hoped for a better future. I heard stories about family members who were sick, friends who were lonely, and people who were sick of being isolated. I met people who lost their jobs and were living in their cars. Several used our parking lot to enjoy their hot meal because they had nowhere to go. It transformed my view of what was truly important in our church and in our world, hope. Our takeout plan worked from April until October, but once we rolled the clock back when daylight savings time ended, it was cold outside and very dark. No one wanted to donate time outdoors in those conditions, including me. But we continued to hope. Now that the pandemic seems to be a bit under control in our area, we mo with most of us triple vaccinated, we decided to move room at our inn and have the chicken dinner inside in Fellowship Hall. I looked at the calendar, and the first Thursday in January is January 6th. As the Holy Spirit rules my life, as you know, this was a sign. January 6th is Epiphany, otherwise known as Three Kings Day. We celebrate this day when the three wise men found our Lord Jesus in his manger and presented him with gifts. His birth was and is the hope for our world. It's the 12th day of Christmas. However, we will not have 12 drummers drumming. We will be serving meals indoors with masks and gloves. So once again, we will, we will be making room at our inn for the hungry, the lonely, and the lost in the hope that Nina Beth's vision of hope peace, joy, and love will continue to abide at Camp Valley Ecumenical Church. And amen to that. <laughs> and now each week of this series, we will close out with a Christmas carol. Yes, Advent is not yet the birth of Christ. However, as we prepare our homes and this house for the holy, we live in the already and not yet. We already know the rest of the story, and yet, we have not seen the fulfillment of a time when suffering ends. 
Today we sing A Little Town of Bethlehem, a carol written by Phillips Brooks in 1865 after a horseback ride between Jerusalem and Bethlehem on Christmas Eve. An original verse not included in our hymnals is especially pointed for our theme. So I'm going to read that for you. Where children, pure and happy, pray to the blessed child, where misery cries out to thee, son of the mother mild, where charity stands watching and faith holds wide the door, the dark night wakes, the glory breaks, and Christmas comes once more. Let us remember that it was in the little and unassuming town where the holy was housed. We too can offer light and hope and a place where faith holds wide the door, even and especially in our little town. Please join our lovely music director <laughs> in playing O Little Child of Bethlehem and we will sing. do invite those who did not have an opportunity to uh, attend the Hanging of the Greens open house uh, last week. I invite you to take your time to and see all the um, stops on the journey um, of uh, Christmas and Advent. Learn about the symbols of Christmas and you will find, I believe, yes, you will find some Christmas to hang on our Christmas trees, so I invite you to do that as well. Our um, sanctuary is open um, Monday through Friday from 9 to 12, and on Sundays from 10 to 12. And so you're welcome to come when it is convenient for you. May God's door of welcome swing open in your heart and in your life. May Christ's humble first dwelling remind you of the plenty you already know. It will, it will feel familiar. And you'll know, you'll say, ooh, this is good. 
And may the Spirit lead you into more possibility and hospitality than you can imagine, making room for the end, in the end, for all. May it be so for you. May it be so for us. May it be so for this church.